Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, I guess I'll get started. Um, I'm actually, uh, my very great pleasure to welcome uh, Irfan Issa, who has been um, at Georgia Tech since 1996. He's a professor, professor there, um, spanning multiple departments, or job spanning multiple departments, um, and has been, and before that, he was at the Media Lab from 88 to 96, um, doing that brilliant trick of getting a job before you start your master's. Um, seems like a good plan. Um, so, um, I, you'll know Irfan for work on uh, many areas of computer vision. Um, I particularly think about him as um, one of the first people sort of at that intersection between uh, vision and graphics, um, but lots of other work on textures, uh, faces, uh, and, uh, animations and analysis of humans, and uh, some all sorts of work on uh, journalism, and, uh, the introduction of journalism and computer science, which I think is uh, unusual for many of us. Uh, he's won lots of best paper awards, but maybe it's um, his work as a consultant with Disney and Google, um, which have led to some uh, of his super high impact uh, outputs. And I think the thing I'm really excited about at the moment is the uh, YouTube video stabilizer, uh, where you just upload a video and it does a nice job of stabilizing it. Uh, and about uh, uh, extensions of that and other work, we shall now speak. Thank you, Irfan. Thank you, Andrew. And everybody can hear me. And feel free to interrupt. Uh, if you notice, the title is long, which basically means I came up with it by combining two different titles. Um, when you start seeing a lot of ands, you know, that should kind of give you an hint of it. So what I'm going to try to do is give you a kind of a sense of two different topics. One is video segmentation. The other one is video stabilization. Uh, one of the core areas that my group works on uh, is really kind of trying to do stuff on enhancement and analysis of video. Uh, I mean, time is one of the basic characteristics of a signal that most of our work is about, and you'll see examples of that today. Um, so just to kind of situate it before giving you an overview first, the two the research questions that my group works on is one basically is the first question is, can you actually analyze and synthesize video so we can improve both the quality of the video and also support its understanding of the content in it? The second question that actually is also is, can we actually use, again, video and other temporally varying signals to analyze what's happening? So one of the areas that we work on is, can we actually understand and ask questions, what is happening in this video sequence? Can we model it and actually also predict it? So there's some work we're doing in this area that's a little bit out there and trying to also both predicting what's likely to happen and also assessing how well something happens. Uh, I won't be talking much about that today, neither will I be talking about the third axis, which is the whole area of trying to understand how do you get to understand the social context with media. That is, how do people create content, how do people share content, and this could be about images and videos, which is again what my interest is, but I'm working with a lot of other people in both text, machine learning, and stuff like that to kind of understand the whole question about how do we generate content and how can we actually validate its quality. So today, though, I'm going to focus on two different ideas. One is this video stabilization that uh, Andrew just mentioned. The goal here is, you know, I was actually about five years ago trying to record my son giving his, uh, in, in U.S., of course, we have commencement speeches even at your sixth grade. Uh, and if you notice, there was an earthquake. No, actually, there was an earthquake. I was nervous. He was nervous. And the camera really shook. And looking at that video, I kind of said, well, that's just bad. The next one is the solution we actually now have. Uh, this is something which we've been working on for a while. Well, there are some artifacts there, but it's actually much more watchable. So that's one of the bigger questions of video stabilization uh, that I'll give you a little bit more uh, understanding of what we tried to do here. The second question was, you know, this is a question that basically imagine that we want to be able to find regions and pixels over video that we want to understand more about. Saliency is one of the biggest issues in computer vision, trying to find the most important pixels or regions that we want to do something with. And of course, we were jealous of a whole lot of other people trying to do this kind of analysis, but we wanted to be able to do it much quickly in the kind of interface I just defined or showed you here. One click, we want to actually, in this instance, foreground, background segmentation, but we want to actually do more than just two layers. We want to be able to extract a lot more layers. 
So using this kind of stuff, can we do scene analysis? Can I learn every actually aspect of an ice skater? Or in this case, you've actually seen results that I'm going to talk a little bit about is, can we now figure out where the roads are, where objects are, where the buildings and trees and the skyline is? Again, using that kind of segmentation, but again, remember, not in images, but in video. So that's the two things we will focus on, and we're going to go through a little bit of stuff very fast. There's a lot of technical details on the slide, but we won't get to all of it. And, uh, and again, as I said, if you want more technical detail, find me and we'll talk about it. So <clears throat> these are the people that I've been working with. As Andrew said, I've also been spending a little bit of time at Google these days. As a consultant, I spend 20% of my time every uh, week, day, month uh, to work with them on various types of things. Again, my goal is research. I don't speak for Google. I speak still for Georgia Tech and myself. But I do consult with a whole lot of stuff that is going on. Here's what we're going to try to do. First, we're going to try to talk a little bit about super pixel, super voxel based res, uh, video segmentation. I'm going to give you a little bit of technical details, but more importantly, what I'd like to do is kind of lead you up to a system that we have running. So one of the basic charters, and if you notice in the slide, is the stabilizer working on YouTube. We've also taken our video segmentation stuff and built a web API. I've gotten this new bug in me is I want to actually do vision research that actually gets used. So that's one of the kinds of stuff we've been pushing on a lot. So that's what we're going to talk about. So one of the things we'll end up with is an, a system. And if you want, videosegmentation.com is a system right now available and running that you can upload your videos and start playing around with. And I'll talk about some of the goals and we, how we got there. Uh, this is all work based on something we did a paper on a while ago, but this is something we've been actually uh, continuing to work on and adding to. So let's get started with that. So one of the basic questions in images has been is, how do you kind of find a bunch of pixels next to each other that have some sort of commonality and basically build on connectedness, and, you know, four pixels or eight pixels a neighborhood, and find something in there. And one of the basic things we'll always use is color distance, or some sort of weighted with gradients, but also kind of do you know, some sort of classification so we can actually combine these regions to give us continuation or some sort of a region that it's not just pixels, but a group of pixels. Now, of course, you need to take this to video domain. And this is one example that we just basically, let's assume, do something like uh, Fulgen Schwab and Hutton Locker per frame. This is what we kind of get. So I'm going to play this again. Uh, now, of course, in this one, we're not trying to build any continuation between frames. We're just saying is, OK, let's take one frame, run something like a, you know, a Fulgen Drop and Hutton Locker, and use that to define regions. But if, in this one, you notice there is no temporal coherence. Uh, one of the biggest things that I like about the image segmentation approaches, and this was something I said many years ago, I would never have thought of working on super pixels. But this one, one of the interesting questions was, well, as I think Vittorio Ferrari said it, one of the good things with uh, super pixel methods is you actually know very quickly where you're wrong. Because they're usually much more efficient in computation. So that's one of the goals we had was how do you take this approach and start adding it, the temporal angle to it to make it much better. And also do uh, understanding of how to do correspondence or coherence between them. So now, of course, you look at the same problem that I had before. What I want to do is I want to connect this pixel forward and backwards. Now all of a sudden, this problem explodes. So one second of a 360p video has 90 million edges. It's a lot more than we want to deal with, because for a single image, <coughs> it was just one, one, one image at a time. Oh, sorry, one, one million for each image case. So how do you actually do these connections? So that was one of the problems we wanted to deal with. And also what we wanted to actually say is, OK, let's start taking information that allows us to do this in time. So of course, we basically said, let's start using some sort of optical flow information. So displaced connections in time along a dense optical flow allows us to start looking for more information from one image to the other. And actually, the next slide, I'll show you what actually happens for the famous flower garden sequence if we do super pixels, but take the connections that are optical flow driven to allow us to connect these types of regions. So here, of course, you notice in this one, the tree looks a little bit much more cogent. And the other one, there is super pixels rotating around, floating around, and that kind of stuff. Now, of course, still, you might be saying is, it doesn't tell me where the tree is. And we'll actually start looking into more of how to actually get us towards giving us a segmentation of trees and stuff like that. This is, of course, the flower garden sequence. Many people have spent a lot of time uh, analyzing it to detail. I showed this to somebody like Michael Black. And he actually can tell you which pixels are wrong. 
I don't know if you guys are very, uh, guys good at that kind of stuff. But again, this is one of those well-tested data sets. Another set of examples, again, where we can actually use predecessor flows and stuff like that. Uh, again, very hard to look at. I'm not showing you the original ones. But now you kind of see, notice the difference between each types of data sets or each types of methods and different parameters or different methods. One of the things we want to do is we want to expose all these types of methods and settings to allow you to play around with these types of things. So why graph-based segmentation? Well, one of the biggest things that came out of this work was we want to be able to compute these types of things fast. We want to be able to also create streaming-based methods. And we also don't want to do a lot of initialization. We want to actually compute as much as possible. If you want to do initialization, we want to do it for the user interface types of things like where is a skater, where is a Coke can, and stuff like that. There's a huge amount of literature in this field. Some of you may know it, all the way from you know, using watershed algorithms to other types of graph-based methods that have been out there. But what we want to do is, again, leverage, just like people who have done this kind of clustering methods, is play around with agglomerative clustering. So which basically says is, I want to find two pixels that are similar to each other. I want to basically combine them together. But what that requires us to do is come up with various types of distance metrics and also iterative processes to combine them. But also what we need is we need some sort of cost measures. So this allows us to kind of start saying is, OK, I have those two types of things. I can look for those and start bring, bringing these types of graph structures out of it. Of course, I have to also keep an eye on the cost. And most of the time, I will put a threshold to cut things off after a certain cost to get at least a solution. Now I'm going to go through some of this very fast because uh, you know, these details are, again, something I can discuss if anybody wants in person. Today, what I'm going to try to show is basically what we can do is we can actually look for three different types of clustering methods. Single link, which basically looks for the min minimum distance between two different clusters, or look at maximum ones, or sometimes also the average link distances. Fulgin Schwab and Huttle Locker uses a single link. I'm going to skip some of this, but this allows you to kind of start saying is now we can actually start looking for these types of distances between clusters. And again, this is something which was in Fulger, Twop, and Hutt Locker, but we needed to be able to do more because we actually had a much, much larger graph network that we want to be able to actually optimize over. I'm going to skip this too. The only thing to look for is that cost function we need to be able to model. So basically, the idea that we want to do is Fulgin, Schwab, and Locker is a single link uh, clustering approach. We want to be able to look for local terminations in the ter dendrogram spacing to be able to create a cost function. And of course, we want to look for monotonic convergence for criteria, uh, monoto monotonic criteria to be able to take the two clusters and merge them. Because one of the things we want to do is merge different types of things. Any type of a cost metric will work here. So how do we take this to the video-based segmentation? Well, we want to be able to create local criteria but in that kind of a context of video, local is what? The next frame, how many frames that we want to start playing around with. Also, for video, the volume is bigger. A lot more data comes in. And we don't really know, in this case of video, what is the size of the regions that we want to look at. So for practical considerations, we'll actually make some assumptions. And you'll see some of those types of things. So this is a case where, if you notice, a very simple example, homogeneous reasons, not a lot of texture in the scene. And we want to be able to create a segmentation from it. So here you see, this is the segmentation from super voxel methods that we come out with. Uh, not very clean, but you, know, you can see some regions are locked and merged a little bit. And again, we can play around with various types of merges. One, we can actually force the merges from one frame to the other or without it. And if you notice, on this case, the segmentations are a bit better, even though for well-defined forced reg um, homogeneous regions. Again, remember what I said, super pixel, super voxel methods will give you something really quick. And what I mean by quick, you'll see examples of that in a bit when I talk about the system. We did a lot of analysis on this kind of stuff. And the truck example basically kind of said that we can actually do understanding, look at these types of things and figure out where the small regions are and large regions are. For textured regions, of course, we have more uh, merging going on than we need. I'm going to skip this too. And basically, this says we came up with various types of merging criteria. Uh, and again, I'm going to skip this because I'm not sure we're going to get to the details of this. Uh, 
Wow, this slide was supposed to be skipped already. Okay. So now let's talk about hierarchy. So one of the things we've done is we want to be able to look at these things at different spatial resolutions. We want to look at larger regions and smaller regions separately. So what we want to be able to do is, uh, and as shown by here, is we want to find different regions and see if they can be connected in different ways so we can do merging at different types of hierarchies. And this allows us to take both information from appearance, texture, and motion to be able to collect these things together, and segment regions and super regions, which allows us to basically now do things which so far we have talked about doing in terms of video. We play around with various types of features, just color, flow histograms, and all kinds of different types of measures that allow us to do this. And actually, now I'm not talking about it, we can actually add depth. So for example, you can actually add an RGB D sensor and as additional thing, and actually works with the same hierarchy. I'm going to skip this too. So here's, let's look at basically the example. Now again, our goal is to work with complicated videos like this. So here you'll see a big explosion, boom. And that's one of the over-segmented results. Uh, you can actually even see the explosion happen. A lot of things are changing in this one. I don't know, I wouldn't claim this is a perfect answer, but this is one of the answers. Let's look at each and every different types of hierarchy that we can look at. Hierarchy at 20%. You actually now see him as a complete one person. Now, of course, uh, as the explosion happens, a lot of texture appearance changes. His shoulder pixels change a little bit uh, on 20% when hierarchy, but it's actually contiguous here, even though it has some errors. We can go up the hierarchy more. And now remember, this is actually giving you super pixels, not just foreground, background, but a whole bunch of them. Uh, the same example that I had shown before, again, we play around with these types of hierarchies there. Uh, many different examples here. This is a very complicated example. Again, just pick up any camera, play around with this, uh, and we want to be able to create segments out of this. So in this one, we kind of manually tuned it to kind of have some sort of a similarity, but the answer is on this side here, on the left. And one more thing that came out of it is that we can actually combine flow flow in segmentation, flow in time, flow in space, all of that kind of stuff in hierarchies across the board and stuff like that. And of course, variety of different answers come. Now, one of the other things we did is, I did kind of touch on it. We want this to work on video and we want it to work on stream videos. This is a long video sequence. You can actually put a whole video of a movie to this. It does it on stream basis, and I'll talk a little bit about what we do with these things too, because one of the bigger goals is we want to be able to find all the possible layers. And examples, this was one of our favorite examples. I mean, very complicated, lots of motion. But if you pay an attention to it, of course, uh, thankfully, the uh, snowboarder, or uh, sorry, uh, waterboarding, he's actually wearing the same black shirt. Even with the turn, you can actually still keep his him in track. And you can see water flowing kinds of all over the place. And variety of parameter settings can be used to kind of look at different types of things. This is another example. Uh, Luck, call it, I don't know, but you can actually keep track of him in the middle. Again, with many different layers coming out of it. So now, we have built this system. Of course, one of our goals was to do this and use this for scene analysis. Uh, so we basically kind of started making this kind of stuff available, and many people have been starting using it. Uh, this is a work on trying to do scene recognition from Svetlana's group and UNC. I'm just going to show you the video which basically uses this as a method to kind of get the segments and uses this for doing scene analysis. So they use our system to get the temporally coherent stuff. And now, but just driving a car, you can kind of see, you can actually do much better at quote-unquote scene analysis, now they can create labels. And the same kinds of labels that we will play around with also in a bit. Another method, this is actually something we did, uh, and there was an idea presented for images a while back called uh, geometric context, which basically was an attempt at looking at an image saying, oh, where can we find the ground image or floor, or cars, moving objects, trees, skyline, and all that kind of stuff, 
by actually first going around, taking a bunch of images, labeling where these things were contextually with reference to each other, where the trees were, where the road was, and all that kind of stuff. And once you do that, you can actually now take any image based on what you'd learned from prior images, you can actually start doing labeling, not just segmentation based on the segmentation. Well, we wanted to take the same idea to video. And that's what basically, uh, this was another CVPR paper that lets us do this, where we basically take images, label them, oh sorry, videos, label them using a tool we came up with. And after we label it, we can actually now start classifying regions uh, and aggregate the predictions over different types of hierarchies. Again, remember, we have hierarchical representations available. And now we can actually get a system that allows us to take scenes like this and classify where the roads are, where the possible moving tracks of cars and such would be, where the trees are, and where the buildings and skyline are. Uh, I'm gonna so this is approximately the approach. and. One of the things we have videos, you don't ever know how long it's going to take. Uh, to do this, of course, classification stuff, we also build this tool that lets you do, and this is the answers that come out of it. This is a tool that allows you to do labeling. So now you can go into video, take one image, rub over certain things. Remember when I showed you this example of the ice skater? This is where we're coming up with. Is now we can label different things. It's almost like a painting brushing interface. Uh, for those of you who work in graphics, this is the kind of stuff has been done for using rotoscoping and all that kind of stuff for building really nice models of different types of things. Here, you're not going to be as accurate as rotoscoping, but we are basically clicking on a super pixel at different hierarchies and propagating this both in a hierarchy and in time. And I'll actually show you this is something which we've been extended even further. Another simple idea that actually we took uh, advantage of, this is work with Singbing Kang at Microsoft Research, Cambridge, uh, in, sorry, in uh, Redmond. We wanted to be able to do the same thing, but one of the biggest problems is we want to do this with handheld cameras. With handheld cameras, if I take a picture video here and move it there, because of auto gain control and all the kind of stuff, it gets brighter and darker. We want to be able to do radiometric uh, calibration from the data itself to be able to then separate out and do segmentation that actually is consistent. So we basically build this whole system to actually support things where we can now do segmentation so here is basically, if you notice, the original sequence is changing because of gain controls, but we can calibrate it, and segmentation now works, because remember, one of the metrics we're using is color values and all, uh, you know, the information that's basically the histogram of colors. So in these things, segmentation now actually is also sensitive, but at the same time, dealing with the fact that auto gain and such will change the image. Another example of work we did on the same thing, but we took it to the YouTube scale, this is work with people at uh, Google, is that if you now take an input video of, let's say, a dog, and somebody goes in and paints from these videos which pixels belong to a possible location of a dog, and you use that as a trainer, and now we can start classifying new videos come in. Now, of course, within that, basically, we will start kind of looking for both texture and appearance over time that might resemble a dog. And we can do this for a variety of different types of uh, regions. I mean, basically, again, in this instance, we do also use a stabilizer, which I'll talk about next, which allows you to find the saliency of where the most interesting things are, then adds to it the segments, regions, and stuff like that, and allows you to basically take all of these types of different features. Remember, now the regions is one more feature we can play around with. And using this with a learning framework, we can now find regions, so this was the data set we had. And now you see stabilized input and output find course. This is basically both stabilized and segmented. And then, basically, you can start kind of looking at a video. Based on the data, find the regions, and it labels this as a dog, because these pixels have some similarity to the classifier we had built for that kind of stuff. Again, sometimes, you know, if you know it doesn't get the whole dog, not each and every pixel, but it gets a majority of the types of pixels. And we did some elaborate studies on it. This is something we're actually now working on a longer version of the paper that should come out soon. So what comes out all of this is now we've built a complete online segmentation annotation suite, uh, suite of software for this. Goal is we want to be able to make it available. People can actually do their own segmentation, play around with this. Initially, it was running on, our work, I mean, on a couple of machines in my lab. 
Right now, it's entirely on the cloud. I got Google to support a complete cloud-based architecture for it. And using this, we can now build a system. And I'll show you examples of this. I'm going to skip some of the details. We came up with lots of approaches to make it faster and all that kind of stuff. And one of the basic ideas was that we basically could take a video volume like this, compute on 30 frames, find an overlap of, a, let's say, 8 or 10 frames, solve for this, but now use that as a constraint from one to the other. So this would be, for example, a constraint system that overlaps two clips, and allowing us to use this kind of computation to be able to do this in much more of a stream-based, clip-based things, which basically says we compute 30 frames, take 10, compute 10, 30 frames, and keep on overlapping it. We never look back. We always go forward. I'm going to skip this too. Um, this was actually one of the ideas that basically, so this, for example, one of the things that, I mean, the reason I mentioned Svetlana's work was they actually wanted to do scenes like this. And one thing they found out was that pixel grouping as you go forward and backwards are problematic. So what basically, they can't actually take those regions, separate them out. What they learned was, and actually this is an insight that we actually benefited from, that if they actually ran the video backwards, the segments were more coherent. Because we, they were actually kind of looking for things that kind of evolve on their own. So we actually added that kind of stuff into our framework. So if you notice, this is going backwards. The regions are a little bit more coherent. So we built in a little bit of back and forth, but not much, because we still wanted to do this over time. And I'm going to actually, this is all stuff available for anybody who wants to watch it uh, or actually wants to use it. I'm going to get to the system. This is the system that works. Uh, when you have animated slides, it take a lot longer to go through. Yeah, OK. So this is the approach. Basically, we compute flow. We over-segment. We have hierarchies. Again, this is done entirely for a video volume. We actually also account for parallelization and that kind of stuff. OK, this is, let's skip all of this. As I said, I did have two talks that I'm merging into one. And I forgot to control all of the animations out of this. Jeez. I'm going to go the easy way. <laughs> so this is the system, videosegmentation.com, that basically you can upload your own videos. I'm going to show you a live use of this uh, here, um, hopefully. Yeah, so you can basically, the only thing is you have to log in. Uh, you can upload your videos. You can create all of your own personal settings that you want. Um, some of them I talked about, and save those settings. It's running entirely on the cloud. I lost my mouse. Okay, move to the next one. So this is the video. I'm going to fast play through this. Remember this video we've seen many times. You can segment it. After you've segmented it, you can annotate it. So now you notice that I can go in and point at different things, label them on the web, look at different hierarchies. When you label them, it's basically picking up the segments of different hierarchies that you kind of can collect. You can save the video for yourself. Download things for yourself if you want. All of that's completely, as I said. Then basically also what we've done now is made this completely available as a source code. So anybody wants to go in, download, 
It's available uh, across the board. But the basic idea, again, is you can actually take a bunch of videos, run the code, get the segments. One of the things, I, the reason I'm actually talking about this, if you actually have your own video segmentation code, we'd like to add that into this hierarchy. So we would have multiple types of solutions with this. All right, this took a little longer than I'd hoped, but partly it was my fault. We can actually also give you access to the code, and you can actually basically generate your own types of APIs, or use the API to write C++ code on this kind of stuff. Let's get back to this now topic of segmentation. These are, again, a series of papers we've done on this topic. Uh, this is also work with uh, Google. In fact, this one is actually much more Google work than Georgia Tech work. Uh, it's all protected and all that kind of stuff, but it's all publicly now known because it's something that's been running for a while. In here, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the ideas that we've been playing around with. The goal, again, is, you know, this is a GoPro video. Again, an earthquake because this person is wearing this uh, uh, GoPro on their head and running a marathon. This is the Boston Marathon. Now, I, of course, Microsoft just... Um, showed us a beautiful way of summarizing. Of course, we're not doing summarizing or trying to take and reduce this. We actually want to show each and every frame. This is the output of our approach uh, and the two side by side. This is a system that I kind of also said is now available on YouTube. So if you upload your video, and I know Andrew told me that he's used it, uh, if you upload a video like this, it'll pop up. And this is the whole suite now available where you can do various types of enhancements on this suite. This is the much more elaborate version of it. And of course, you can do things like filters and colors and all that kind of stuff, which is now built in. Uh, but there's one button, which is auto fix, which actually will try to enhance it and stabilize. And if you notice, the five seconds, and now you now have real time preview. And you have an interface where you can now see the original or the stabilized one by just moving that slider. This is real-time preview. Of course, a preview is at about half the video re NTSC video resolution. This actually does work on full H HD. Oh, by the way, the thing I skipped over a whole lot, our video segmentation now also works on full HD. It doesn't just work on NTSC video signals. It works on high, high resolution. So let's talk a little bit about how we can do this kind of stuff. And of course, you can run this on your own, uh, play around with these types of things, and you know, various things show up. One thing I'll talk about in a second also is when you actually upload a video uh, like this, it'll actually show up several of the times saying, hey, we've detected that this needs to be enhanced. Uh, and we will actually then, so if this thing will pop up, we detected your video may be shaky. Would you like us to stabilize it? So that one button is the only input that this system requires. These were the requirements from the YouTube enhancement folks. We actually initially came up with that had several striders and all that kind of stuff. They said, nope, our users don't like sliders. It has to be automatic, only yes and no. And that was the user interface and the design they developed. We actually built the algorithm to support it. So how does it work? Uh, well, so one basic thing that comes up in this is we've actually simplified the whole problem a lot. And the way we simplified it is, of course, started looking at the literature. One of the best things we saw is, of course, there is a whole lot of work out there in stabilizers. Sometimes it's the hardware solutions, which are built-in camera types of things. Or there is, of course, post-process stabilizations out there, which removes low-frequency information or just does everything in the back end. We were much more on the uh, post-process side of the world. We wanted to really, I mean, our requirement was that this would be something we wanted running on YouTube. Uh, we want to be able to estimate the jerky motions. We want to smooth the camera path. So basic idea was we wanted to be able to find a camera path and try to smooth that out to the best of our ability. So that's what L1 and L2 types of optimizers were used. And then we want to be able to synthesize a new frame. So here's the idea. This is the original video. Now, a few assumptions that actually are true these days on the world of YouTube, may not be true in the professional video domain, is... Uh, most of the time with these types of small videos, you will try to keep the subject in the center. Two, most of the videos would be wide angle. Nature of the beast, again, true with GoPros, true with your uh, smartphones and stuff like that. Uh, so how do we actually now leverage this? Well, what we want to do is we want to find a viewport in this larger video, and we want to be able to find and stabilize the best region out of this, uh, and we want to be able to synthesize those frames. Uh, so this is basically one of our outputs on the earliest outputs. So the red marker basically now finds the best possible viewport within an optimization framework 
and displays just that. So yes, there is a little bit of cropping. Now one of the biggest questions we get asked is, oh, why do you do cropping? Uh, well, and again, if you notice, there are different types of things will show up in here's one is why do we do cropping uh, and by basically we don't want to go outside the window because if you took this window out and kept the same size, we would have to do some sort of in-painting. There are many solutions for doing in-painting, but most of the time there is a little bit of an artifact that shows up. We decided that was something not worth it for us. So that was an assumption and you know, kind of the design decision we did. If you notice in this case, the window is getting smaller and bigger. That was one more thing we added. How do you kind of keep the uh, size of the crop window. Now, all of you who know computer vision pretty much easily kind of start saying is, oh, we're basically trying to look for translations, rotation, scale, and a little bit of homography in 2D uh, to be able to model all of this. And you'd be right. Because that's in essence what we do, is we basically kind of estimate the motions by looking at, again, nothing else but optical flow types of scenarios and looking at information. So here, for example, in this video, we're basically computing motion from frame to frame and using that to compute different types of information that could be allowing us to now take this frame or this viewport and stabilize it within a sequence. So much simpler approach, but there are a few additional things we had to do to make this work. So of course here, a couple of things to look at is if we just completely looked for foreground background, or not paid attention to foreground background and a car drove by, it might move the camera with the car. We don't want to do that. So we did put a little bit of a thresholds to look for foreground versus background motions. So we didn't want to separate that out. Now remember, previous work I talked about with doing video segmentation, part of the motivation was to get towards that, but that was still too computationally uh, costly for us to use that here. So we have much different smaller metrics for doing this kind of just foreground background segmentation here. So examples of this kind of stuff is, you know, we want to be able to do this with as few degrees of freedom as possible. So these are the kinds of videos that uh, you may upload uh, to the uh, system. And, you know, if you run things like, you know, simple KLT types of trackers on it, you would get motions like this or data like this. What we want to do with this is extract out translation, of course, which basically kind of says, as oh, we want to look for how this region moves over in X and Y. If we just do this on a video frame, yeah, fine, it might work, but it's still going to be shaky, as you notice in the top frame after just showing you the result. So just simple X, Y translation is good, but not efficiently the right answer. Uh, the next part is, okay, similarity, translation in both X and Y. Uh, we also want to look for scale. So that's why our window needs to get bigger and smaller, or the viewport needs to get it's more four degrees of freedom. And this one, now actually you can start seeing it's got a rotation. It could get bigger and smaller. Again, using 2D information as much as possible. But now we want to also kind of look at. So here the answer is, yes, it's there. But if you notice, it's got a little bit of wobble because the warping artifacts are coming in. Third answer, third stage, now we actually look for homography. Translation in X and Y, X, rotation and scale, all of them included, more degrees of freedom, eight degrees of freedom. We actually now can capture skew and perspective variations. Uh, this is a little bit more stable. So this would be our simplest way to get things done, right? And actually, one of the things we added to it is various ways of trying to optimize over the path. So here, it would be an example, looking at this thing is, looking at this frame, computing over it. The blue line is approximately the path uh, over the frame, both in X, then in Y. Now we can add scale. So this allows us to now start kind of putting constraints on how to smooth out these paths. Of course, uh, I'm still keeping it a little bit simple in how I'm explaining this, but uh, it'll grow, grow in complexity. So now we want to take those paths and smooth them. So here, for example, would be our different paths, right? Approximate original path. The red line is where the original path might be. We want to actually now compute the blue paths. Now, what we did was we added constraints to it, and we understood a lot more about cameras. A camera that's basically kind of on a tripod will actually just do very simple kinds of tripod fixed motions. The other one, which might be a pan or one that might pan and come back, 
are different orders of frequent, oh, it's different differentials on this information. So we can, we can look at a tripod, which would be fixed, which would just be a straight line. Uh, we could look for a, some sort of a tripod with dolly or pan, which would allow us to look for these types of additional constraints. And then we could actually figure out how to go from one to the other and add various types of motions through it. And again, what we would do is actually add parabolic segments. So here would be an example, original video. And now what we've actually done is we found the whole path, the envelope of all possible motions that are constrained by the original viewport, because that's the maximum I could go. And now we have basically a variety of things. So you can actually imagine this also gives us a sense of how big our crop would be. So another thing we added was automatically figuring out how big a crop window we can actually add. So again, one of the things we added in these types of things is various types of optimizers. Uh, and we could play around with them. And we could play around with different types of cost functions we could use to figure out what would be the best possible path. Now, one advantage we had was this is a purely data-driven system. We don't know what camera it's coming from. And we can actually analyze a lot of footage to figure out what kinds of camera motions are good for different types of things. So we actually, what we did was, initially, we even sat down and digitized a bunch of very famous movies and looked at cliplets of that and learned these kinds of what are the best set of parameters we can use to model this. And that, basically, our motion, well, thing was that within this envelope, we want to remain data-driven, but at the same time, find the optimal path through it. Of course, then we want to be able to synthesize that best frame. Now, a couple of things I'm going to skip over. Some of them are dealing with things like motion blur. Some of them are dealing with things like uh, some blurry artifacts that come because you know, optical flow kind of warping messed up or different types of things. We have various types of ways of finding filters to be able to adapt to them. But if you notice the top one, the window is getting bigger and smaller. And if you notice, I'm showing a lot of uh, our own videos because you know, this is a presentation. We have to actually have a lot of our own videos because you know, otherwise we get in trouble. Or publicly available videos I can show in talks like this. Uh, so here is, a, in fact, this was one of our first few results about four years ago. Uh, publicly uploaded, original, with crop, and that next one is the result. Now, of course, you'll notice her head might get cropped off. I don't know if this is the video. No, this one it doesn't. But in several videos, yeah, it might be a little bit more cropping than you need. Uh, of course, we've done a lot of user studies to also say that people actually do prefer some of the stabilized versions. And of course, all of a sudden, we have now a huge amounts of data that we can play around with. So this is, for example, one of the classic examples we played with before. Very shaky video. Now, of course, this actually has other artifacts that are not just because of the camera. I mean, this has rolling shutter, in which will resolve in a bit. This is somebody wearing a camera on a helmet, biking around, or motorbiking, I think, in, uh, somewhere in the Middle East. So let's talk about rolling shutter. So we basically started getting really kind of getting into this world. And as this was about the time when more smartphone videos were coming up on YouTube. And smartphone videos have an interesting problem. This is, of course, us using a camera and rotating it. And you notice a lot of non-rigid in the scene, right? The beams look like they're not rigid at all. Of course, in this camera, the camera is being rotated. And that's a, one of the worst examples of rolling shutter. Uh, so next to each other, comparison. This is the original video. Now let this play. By the way, for those of you who are curious, the next video that looks stable is actually still a video. You can see the person is walking. Uh, so that's one of the, and there's a little bit of shake at the bottom that you can see. So how do we do this? Of course, in this one, we also we want to be able to take the camera motion and from that camera motion uh, be able to compute things that will allow us to model, for example, sorry, I skipped through this fast. Uh, one of the bigger problems with rolling shutter is that we need to account for the fact that by the time you come and you're, you're scanning down, your, I mean, your image might be at a different location because, or your camera might be at a different location. So how do we account for those types of things? We need to be able to then kind of model an image into various types of strips, right? So in essence, one of the reasons warp is happening is by the time the camera is registered different types of things, the camera might have moved a little bit. So 
Glow World shutter would have kept that image straight. Rolling shutter, of course, if you notice, uh, the subject is a little bit warped. Uh, and if you imagine moving those types of things, it'll be worse. So this is basically what we need to account for. And you know, this has been, of course, work done before. Uh, Simon Baker from Microsoft Research has done work on this kind of stuff. This was the original video. So when we actually initially developed our YouTube system, this was the output from our system. Didn't account for rolling shutter. So we basically came up with, through the data, kind of understanding or modeling the readout variables, because we don't know exactly what the camera is doing. We want to only get it from the data itself. So again, we model this kind of behavior by looking at now strips and computing the homography for each and every one of those strips. The so same kinds of stuff that we did for the whole window, now we do it for small strips. And using that, we come up with measures of how do you actually compute the homography. Of course, now we have to now leverage all those homographies back into the system. Uh, this is a solution from Baker et al. Uh, improved over the original, but now after rolling shutter, now yes, there is a little bit more blur because we are doing a little bit of blending of different types of things. But in this bad quality video, it's a little bit more stable. There might be a little bit of floating of different types of things going on. So we model the whole electric, you know, the shutter phenomenon from data, and these results are kind of going through much more detail, and I'm going to, again, as usual, skip over a lot of stuff. We compute, again, optical flow, different types of things. And here is basically we predict based on knowing from the data where each pixel is likely to be from one frame to the other, or where these registration marks might be again. So we predict a lot of this and actually done using, again, purely empirical information from the data itself. And we can figure out from that where are the likely warps and dewarps that are based on this, take the different homographies, create a Gaussian mixture of all homographies, and then use that to register back onto the original image. Again, original with homography mixtures, little crisper. Now, if you notice, there's a problem here. Uh, we are cropping, so that's why you see the label floating in and out on the top. That's one of the artifacts of cropping. This is one of the phenomenon of just having text done before. We also looked at data just like we did for other types of things and look at which homography parameters are the ones that get varied most on online videos. Just emphasize those, so which allows us to do a lot less computation. So we just look at uh, and, and reduce the degrees of freedom much significantly. And of course, now the whole pipeline is allowing us to go from input videos, look for similarities, but also look for warpings. And we can do it at different frequencies and allow this to do warp and crap, uh, warp and crop, crap. Uh, and then basically use this to remove wobble. Now, there is work on this kind of stuff before. Many people have done this kind of uh, uh, different types of approaches to do rolling shutter. Um, ours is basically uh, homography mixtures, and more importantly, it requires no calibrations, purely data-driven. We also did a full user study on this kind of stuff with uh, looking at variety of things. We you know, showed people each and every example. Uh, of course, the labels here, ours, Baker et al., and all that kind of stuff were not existent in the study. Uh, by the way, notice it works for images and videos like this, very less features and stuff like that. It's dark. Uh, compared it, and of course, I wouldn't be showing this to you unless and until our results were, which are, of course, in red. And it works on different types of data, iPhones, and uh, walking with our, you know, diff, uh, GoPros and stuff all the way to uh, playing around with. And these are the kinds of results, again. Very complicated. This was a explosion in Maryland somewhere about a few years ago. Somebody uploaded a video. If you notice, uh, not a lot of good texture here to lock into. Uh, this is the result. Still not perfect, a lot of blurriness. But if you just compare them next to each other. Oops, sorry, played it fast. Oh, one thing which I'm not talking about today is, and if anybody's interested, there is a full API available if you do any kind of coding on YouTube to use 
the whole software system that I talked about too, available from Google. If anybody's interested, uh, just you know, ask me or just search for it, it's available there. Just to show you again, this is the interface on YouTube. Shaky pops this up with a question saying, would you like to up uh, improve it, preview, then you hit this yes, save changes. This will save, of course, the previewed version, and then it'll actually save in a few minutes the whole HD version of your video. And you can actually download it. One of the biggest questions I get from people is, oh, that means Google has my video? Well, yes, but you can download it for your workstation also. I love the interface that comes out of this, is that we can actually visualize this kind of stuff very cleanly. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of the pipeline, but basically this is running over a huge cloud. Uh, many, many computers are used to support this kind of stuff. First, of course, the estimation is done, then uh, stabilization is done, then back to a live stream to user. That's why usually when you upload a video, it takes like about four or five you know, milliseconds or something like that, or almost a second for it to pop up. And again, you know, this is the kinds of results that we have gotten. Uh, this is, again, you know, not our video. Uh, of course, I remember Andrew sent me one of his skiing videos also. Uh, not a lot of texture here, but, and the thing that, again, the same idea that I showed you with video segmentation, it's actually clip-based, and it can run on infinitely long videos. So there is no bound to it, and there's no back and forth. Uh, and here, actually, this is one of those examples, because if you notice, the viewport is getting smaller and bigger based on the content again. Yeah, we've actually run this on a couple of hours of movies, not just segments like this. A uh, couple of addition things that have come up is if you do these days uh, stabilization, and if you have an overlay like this, because people can add overlays, uh, it's a disaster. Uh, this is actually uh, the video of me hooding Matthias Grenman, the person who did all the work for his dissertation. And it's a, so now what we can do is we've added abilities to look for overlays, detect overlays, and not run the algorithm or change the coding a little bit to actually keep the window much bigger, but also accounting for the stabilization that comes in. So here you notice it's shaky, but it knows that it's detected automatically or det uh, that there might be something else much more fixed. So it's shaky a lot more. But once the overlay goes away, it starts doing the optimization. Yes, and if you actually here, you notice a little bit of the example of the blur I was talking about. There is a little bit of blur, and actually we, there is one enhancement that we have added since that actually gets rid of the blur. So if you run it now, some of the blur stuff is better. All right, so this I'm going to skip, but oh no, actually this is one of the basic ideas. Right now the numbers are such, and these are publicly available numbers, 100 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube every minute. About 10 hours of video every minute is using the stabilizer. After all of the 100 goes through the check, saying, hey, is this stabilized or not? The good thing that we like about it is that uh, many of the people who actually get the stabilized result, 95% are actually are keeping it. Some of them are turning it off. 5% of them are turning it off. And you know, people are accepting stabilization a lot more out of this. Some of them, I actually must admit, I'm surprised they keep it. Because I look at the results, and I say, I would not have kept it. Uh, but the people like it. Uh, this stuff is now also in cave, put into other types of things. So if you upload images with burst photography on Google+, uh, these things are also done. So this is when you do a burst photography like this, using the same approach, we can create an auto GIF, which is basically aligned and created an animation version of your child. We can also do exposure fusion HDR, same approach. It has to be, of course, a burst, really frames close to each other and also much more scary stuff like this. So we can actually make you know, people create auto GIFs and kinds of stuff out of it. Lots of other types of things are also showing up uh, using this kind of, uh, again, this is the final result. I think this I like a lot. These two I like a lot. They're cute. The face stuff really does kind of creep me out. Uh, but it's there for those of you who actually play around with it. Uh, Many videos like this now show up uh, where basically, again, this was a professional car driver. Uh, and you notice the difference. Shaky video from a car driver in the car versus the stabilized version next to each other. Uh, various types of things come out of this. We have seen some amazing videos. 
We have to always hunt down and get permission from people to share it, but we've been doing that a lot. So in summary, basically, again, I've told you two different systems. One, a video stabilizer that you can play around with, or you may have actually already used, you might not know it, uh, which is actually very good. Uh, then the other thing I showed you is this kind of a much more researchy stuff to actually do uh, localization of a group of pixels in a video and then use that for doing scene analysis. We played around with those types of things. I mean, to me, this still remains an interesting question. Can I actually now do scene analysis or behavior analysis with multiple layers of regions over time to be able to then find all possible activities or motions of ice skater or scenes like this, purely the kind of stuff we've been doing in images. And I'm not saying that those problems are solved in images. They're still hard in images. But we can actually start doing those types of things in video. Uh, more information, look at my website, all my papers. And more importantly, the links to my students who have done all of the hard work are there. And you can hunt us down. And more importantly, just play around with both of them. Videosegmentation.com is live. It's on the Google Cloud. Initially, you could have, when you get there and when somebody else was using it, you would be put on a queue. Now it just spawns off another cloud workstation to do it. Uh, and that, I finished almost in time. Thank you. For your, yep. your exploitation, you said it worked on the RGB decent set. Uh, what um, cameras do you use for that? Uh, we both use the Kinect camera and also a variety of other types of RBG, RGBD cameras, including the newer Kinect version also. Um, so basically, we, we can now, I mean, as long as the depth can be aligned somehow or the other, which in these cameras could be, we can actually now do both the scene segmentation, but also go towards classification, the kinds of examples I showed you. Basically, that's exactly what we do. That's exactly what we're doing. I mean, basically, this is another modality of doing things like connections. Yep. So superpixels are a very useful intermediate representation, but one of the problems with superpixels is that uh, it's hard to assess the quality independent of the tasks that you will use the superpixels for. So, for example, in the semantic segmentation applications, you mentioned things like temporal continuity or uh, over-segmentation may not be as critical if you can still solve for the semantic label, uh, given the superpixelization, can you say a little bit how you want to connect the, or how you could connect the things that you have done um, to sort of more the task? So basically, for example, adapt the superpixelization to a task. So I mean, and so one thing which you're leading up to is, you know, simply if I create this hierarchy across uh, a video sequence, and now I can, for example, see a Coke can, or I can see the Coke can with the Coca-Cola written on it and the swirl on it differently in different hierarchies. How do I connect them up into one semantic object? So we actually are kind of more moving towards asking that question. And actually, some other people are also. I mean, I think Bernd Schiele's group has done some nice work on that kind of getting to the semantic label. What we are providing right now is a tool to let you kind of create those semantic labels. So now, actually, if you can go in and look at a cocan and now create a hierarchical representation that combines the Coca-Cola text and the red region over time, that'll allow you to create a semantic label, and then you can detect it. So to be very clear, when I'm presenting this video segmentation, I'm presenting this as an additional cue towards doing semantic analysis of videos. I don't think that's the final answer. You need to do a little bit better representation of connectedness of an object, both in space and time. I mean, super pixels, as you notice, if you look at it as humans, we are very good at figuring out where the person was and the outline was. But most of the time, they're broken up. So in that case of you know, uh, No Country, f what was that movie? No, yeah, was no Country something something. For All Men. For all men. I mean, you basically, even though he was wearing a different shirt and a pant, he converted himself into one person. To some extent, if you really look at it in super pixel, that was a wrong answer. It should have had the different shirt and the different pants. But the colors of those things were similar. That's why it became one. Uh, so those types of things remain a problem. We actually still uh, we actually working on methods right now, and I'm happy to talk to anybody else, that lets you figure out better ways of which hierarchy to choose. So right now, we don't know which hierarchy to choose, right? Which, where, where do you pick up from over-segmentation to under-segmentation? That whole space is available. But how does Svetlana choose a point there? Did she 
cross-validate or something. So they, they basically kind of point and again look at different hierarchies in their annotation and choose the one that best suits them. So the user is the one that's defining how to connect it. But there should be a better way of doing that if you have more data. And actually, that's the kind of stuff we're working on. I know Svetlana is working on that kind of stuff too now. So we are, lots of people are trying to get to it. I know uh, some people here also at Oxford are working on that. Oh, so at Cambridge are working on that kind of stuff too. I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm basically looking for solutions myself of that type. Yep. Uh, just a short question. When you do this rolling shutter business with the homographies, mm -hmm. do you relate them? Like, uh, because I would expect them to be um, related. Like, if you have one shift from from like the highest block to the second, you would expect something similar to happen to the next uh, strip. So, do, do you relate the homographies, or are they completely independent? So they are connected, connected because we know about the readout where each and every homography is. So we look for the highest resolutions by doing the Gaussian mixtures it actually automatically selects the one that actually has the most perturbation. Now, if, for example, there's a huge, so for example, to be very honest, when you do rotations like this, it can predict very quickly what's going to happen because now it's figured out from the rotation of the uh, camera, uh, the angular flow. So the mixtures work very well because it can look for those types of things. But if you just kept on doing uh, large motions like this, which are not actually what's something they can deal with, then you'll let's see, you'll see a lot more artifacts. So what we do is our windows can get bigger and smaller. There is sub-regions, but we, for practical purposes, do kind of keep it that you look for a few neighborhoods next to each other. In our much more detailed version, which is not anywhere close to the speed, we can do a much better job of looking at the mixtures. But for practical purposes, we've actually kind of limited its neighborhoods that allows us to look for specific types of motions. I don't know if that answered mm. your question. Yeah, I meant more the homographies. Do you, do you cost like a difference in the homographies uh, that, that you... Because you have different homographies for every step, yeah, right? exactly. So, so do, you, do you have like a, a cost... Um, like do you use the information, like let's say the first two strips, mm -hmm. um, like the motion that, that you have in, in time between these yeah. two okay. for the next ones? Yes, we do. It's completely temporal. So we basically look for so it. jointly solve it. Absolutely. Okay. It's a completely temporal measure. Looking at it from one frame to the other and across the thing. Okay. And that's how it keeps it smooth. And actually, that's why some of the blurring comes in. Because it's doing some sort of a filtering in time, and therefore some pixels get blurred. And that's why we have to then look at the warp that comes in from the mixture and unwarp it to get a sharp mask again. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Sorry, okay, there was so a lot of stuff in there, but Carl. If I'm about to go for lunch now, and if you'd like to get some time in our friend's calendar later, he'll be around this afternoon. So if you want to talk to him, uh, email Holly and, um, or talk to me at lunch. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.